You don't have to go far in Australia to be blown away by the scale of the place. Between each town and city, there's a whole lot of not much that, OK, call me silly, I just didn't get from looking at the map. And in actual fact, Australia's size and sparse population explain why the country finds itself at the forefront of robotics. We have limited supply of labour that wants to work in mining, in agriculture, um, in infrastructure monitoring and so forth. Hence, over the last 20 years, there's been a lot of development in field robotics and the commercial uptake of field robotics. High wages and living standards have led to the highly automated environments that you find here, although not everyone is happy about it. As the country's robotic reputation grows, a recent survey found that Australians are the most nervous population in the world about the rise of automation and what it means for jobs. But in this famously huge landscape, the genie may well be out of the bottle. Of course, Australia is also famous for its mining. There's loads of great stuff down there, and getting it out is massive business. In fact, everything about mining is massive. This truck is over seven metres high. This train is a mile long, and it's one of 40 which shift nearly a million tonnes of iron ore to the coast every day. We've come to the Pilbara, one and a half thousand miles from civilization and one of the richest sources of iron ore in the world. These days mining is less about digging stuff up and more about blowing it up and it's such a relentless, enormous and dangerous job that taking humans out of the loop makes a lot of sense. Here on its Hope 4 iron ore mine, Rio Tinto was one of the first to introduce a fleet of trucks which are both enormous and autonomous. Autonomous, you could say. It is incredible to think no one is driving this. It's quite a scary thought or quite a scary thing to see a truck run past with no operator. At first I was, I was definitely sceptic. You know, if you're going to be out there with nobody in control of them, then what's going to stop them from making me flat? But by combining information from an array of radar sensors, GPS and some very clever software, Rio Tinto says these things are actually safer than human drivers. When a truck is driving towards you, you're never quite sure whether the person has had enough sleep last night, whether they are adjusting the music with the iPod. Uh, you're never quite sure what their state of mind is, but an autonomous truck will do exactly what it's programmed to do. The central computer is giving the truck a mission. The truck is fulfilling that mission. It will be going to a loader and then going to a, a dump area or going to a crush area. And the truck is negotiating with the central computer in real time. Can I move? Can I move? Can I move? The position of every vehicle, every borehole, and all the geological data are added to this 3D visualization of the mine site, displayed live on this massive video wall at Rio Tinto's command center. Every piece of its equipment from its mines around the world can be analyzed here in real time. The aim is to make the drills, the crushers, and the copper concentrators ever more efficient by tweaking the settings to better cope with the precise geology of that location. And with such massive numbers involved, tiny percentages of extra efficiency translate into huge savings for all of us. About 5% of the world's energy goes into crushing and grinding rocks. So for Rio Tinto, it's really important to get this process right. In fact, the system can self-learn, meaning it can recognise similarities in situations that might be too complex for humans to spot. And while those humans might still be needed to supervise the software, what are the people who have been replaced by the machines? Rio Tinto prefers to think of it less in terms of redundancies and more in terms of new employees coming in with new skills. Not miners, but engineers, analysts and programmers. We put autonomous trucks into the newer mines as they started up. So it meant that we didn't hire 60 additional people for this mine site. And with the roster patterns that we run at the moment, that's roughly uh, four times that number of people that we don't actually need. You move the human away from where the human can be exposed to safety risks, 
You know, these are, these, are, these are roles where they've got high energies around them, and you're moving the humans into more supervisory roles. As a non-miner, I can certainly see the attraction of running a site from a comfortable remote location rather than commuting to the backs of beyond to specially built mining camps or towns for shifts lasting a couple of weeks at a time. This is a lifestyle known as FIFO. Fly in, fly out. And it's as fun as it sounds. I actually live on the other side of Australia. Week on, week off. And um, yeah, three flights for me to get home from here. And a lot of time sitting at the airport. If something happens at home, then it's you can't just pack up and shoot off for a couple of hours to make sure everything's okay. Definitely one of the privileges is to be able to do this job and go home every night. And it's, you know, it's, it's just awesome. Otherwise, I'd be flying in and out and leaving everyone behind every week. The move towards automation could eventually spell the end for this way of life. And Rio Tinto is already working on ways to remove humans from the equation elsewhere, from automating the huge borehole drills to self-driving trains. They're also looking at automating the lighter vehicles to deliver stuff around the site or to take measurements. At the moment, I'm being measured by a 3D scanning laser rangefinder that geologists might use to look at the mine in 3D and map it out. It does seem to me that, for mining at least, automation might free people from the shackles of isolated places like this, which means they can spend more time in places like this. Time to ditch the dirt and 